I'm so glad. So glad. That Jesus is coming soon. Yeah. Yeah. We have been saying that yeah. for a long time. For a very long time. Very long. Very long. My grandmother yeah. Yeah. told my mother. Oh. Modern electronic equipment technology today, somewhere on it, there's a reset button. Because when the man manufactures it, he knows it's going to overheat or it's not going to heat up at all. And he's going to have to reset it. And I got to thinking, God is so wise. He knows that at between now and his coming, yes. now and his appearing, yes. we need to have a reset reset. Yes. And his reset comes in the form of revival. Yes. Yes. You gotta reset because sometimes we have become so familiar with God we take him for granted. We need a reset. There comes a time in dealing with God that we want to take matters into our own hands. We need a reset. Somebody wrote a little chorus one time, send a great revival to my soul. Reset me, Lord, because if he were to come tonight, I'm so afraid for myself. I'm so afraid for us. Lord, send a great revival to the Southwest Region Conference. And let it begin with the president. Let it begin with the department officers. Let it begin with the secretaries in the office. Let it begin with the pastors in the field. Lord, send a great revival to folk who look just like us. I was sitting up here tonight, listening and observing. I don't know why God puts up with us. Every day I say to God, every day, I'm so glad you're God, cause, but I still don't understand you. I don't understand you. I was in a gathering not too long ago in Virginia, and we had a good meeting. The Lord blessed, the Holy Spirit did what he came to do. And as we closed, the leader of the group stood up and said in closing now, I want you to remember the devil is busy and he's doing this, and he's doing that, and he's doing the other. I stood up and I said, excuse me, this ain't the devil's meeting. We don't, we don't do this on this side of the cross. We don't give the devil God's glory. And I just, I'm bringing that up because we need a reset in how to glory God. It's not in the clapping of the hands. It's not in the stomping of the feet. It's not in the shouting and the yelling. It's in knowing that we give God the glory the way he looks for it, and that is giving him the glory. I said on this side of Calvary, we have to know who we are in the eyes of God. He created us for his pleasure. And I'm not going to take pleasure in honoring him. I'm just going to glorify his name. Does that make sense to you? You see, because the devil, when you read Revelation 12, it comes out very clear and sharp. The devil hates God with a passion. He hates him as no other being could hate another being. Well, I'm talking about Satan, Lucifer, the old dragon. 
And I'm going to tell you something, because you love God, the devil hates your very guts. And you're around here talking about I'm in the game of life. There is no game with the devil. The devil is out to kill you, Negro. The devil hates you with a passion. And the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your living savior, who went through Gethsemane for you, the devil says you changed camps on me, but I'm, I'm gonna change my tactics on you. And haven't you heard yourselves say among yourselves, I don't know what has happened. Ever since I came to Jesus, the devil has been wreaking hell on me. Well, you have to answer that, give God the glory. The devil does not bother his own. He does not bother his own. When you take sides against the devil, it means you're taking sides with Jesus Christ. And then you must remember, saints, the devil used to live in glory. Don't you ever forget that. And because he got beside himself, do you know what the spirit of prophecy teaches us? That when God created Lucifer, he made him head and shoulders above all the other angels. Did, 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 have you ever studied this thing about Lucifer in the spirit of prophecy and Isaiah and, and, and Ezekiel? Satan came forth from the hands of God. Listen to this statement. God created Lucifer as much like himself as possible. God created Lucifer as much like himself as possible. Stay with me. When he built the throne for this mighty angel, he made it to look just like the throne of the Son of God. And he set it, he placed it beside the throne of Jesus Christ. You would think sitting on that kind of a throne, you'd maintain your heavenly senses. You'd think being that close to the Son of God himself, who could lean over and tap you on your knee and say, had you thought about that? <laughs> Stay with me. Saints, the devil, the Bible says no man can stand in the presence of God because his presence is fiery. It will consume you. But Satan, Lucifer at the time, had the power of God to stand in the raw presence of God and not be consumed. How that Negro lost his mind, I don't know. That close to God, standing in the raw glory of God and not be consumed, could look him in the eye and talk to him back and forth, could seat, be seated beside the sun and whisper things to each other and then get up from there and go to the angels and say, he's a liar. He ain't right. Something wrong with him. He's not fair at all. And then to be the angels, to listen to that kind of garbage and take sides with that demon. Something wrong. Something wrong. And I read Revelation 12, the night seated up here. And I read where the devil is so smart. He deceives the whole world. I'm in Jesus. I'm in Jesus. And Jesus is in me. But if I'm not careful in Jesus, 
I'll end up deceived by the devil. The devil doesn't give a hoop about you. And he lived in heaven. He knows the golden streets. He knows the gates. He knows the throne of God. He knows the angels up there by name. He knows the tunes they sing. He knows about the tree of life. He knows. And because he lost his cotton picking mind and was kicked out, he says, I've been kicked out. I'm not going to let you get in. And some of us have been so deceived that we have to have a reset. Some of us sitting here tonight, if it wasn't for the grace of God, if it wasn't Booker, well, I'll be John Brown. Louise, don't you all leave here tonight. You see, saints, that reset button is so important that we fail to realize the Gethsemane effort. We have read this text that I use today by the glory of God. And we have talked about Jesus being depressed. Yeah. We, it, it talks about his grieving. Yeah. It, it talks about him getting so sick to the stomach from pain and agonizing yeah. that he wanted to vomit. Remember that? Yeah. And I said, Jesus, what in the world did you go through all of that for? Yeah. He says, I'm looking for your reset button. I'm trying to push a button that's going to stimulate you to come out of that bondage of deception that everything is all right between you and your God and you're hell bound. I raise the question again. What happened to Jesus in Gethsemane? Take your Bibles. I think it's 1 Corinthians I want to look at tonight. No, it's 2 Corinthians. And tell me, Brother President, when to stop. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to focus on verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to focus on verse 21. For he made 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Listen to this. For God made him the son of God who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For God made him his only begotten son. He made him to be sin for us. You see what it says? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. God kept pushing the reset buttons, but nothing seemed to work. And finally, he says, the only way I'm going to get that piece of equipment, that human body in line with eternity, I've got to send my only son, my only begotten son. And so when I come to Gethsemane, and I see Jesus under such stress and pressure. Is it that he's afraid of the devil? No, he says in Luke, I was up there when he messed up. And I pulled the chain. I pushed the button to the trap door. 
I've got him so that one moment he was there and the next nanosecond he was gone. I was there when he fell like lightning out of my father's house. Great God, hallelujah. If God could kick a devil out, what makes you think he can not take a saint in? Stay with me now. Stay with me. When Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God, was in the garden that night, and he said to Peter, James, and John, this is, this is as far as you go. And they said, well, where are you going? And the Bible says, and he went a little farther. That's one thing I like about God. There is no distance too great for him to reach you. He'll hear your cry and he'll show up. He, he says, my ears are not heavy where I can't hear you in the middle of the night. My ears are not heavy when, I, when, when you whisper. I can pick you up clear and sharp. My arms are not short. I don't care where you are. I can find you and lift you up and take you from the guttermost into the kingdom. An old Italian inmate said to me the other night, he had not been to my meetings before. And that old Italian guy walked up to me before I could get off the floor. And he wrapped me in his arms. And he said, preacher, I'm a bad man. And I held on to him. And then he said, no, no, no. After tonight, that's changed. You have shown me Jesus. And I'm now a good man. That's what the Bible is all about. That's what the Bible is all about. I've been preaching out of this thing, Booker, a long time. And I have yet to see it make a good man bad. I've been preaching out of that thing around the world. I've yet to see it make a, a, a good man bad. But I've seen it make bad men good. Now let's get into the garden. It's late. Jesus walks in, and who is there waiting for him? That no good devil. And some of you playing with the devil, you're playing with your soul's eternal destiny. You got to make up your mind. Either I worship God and go to heaven, or I worship the devil and go to hell. That's your decision. And so when he walked in there, the pressure that Satan was applying was so strong that I understand from the medical field that the capillaries of his sweat glands ruptured. The pressure was so great that his, 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 his sweat glands, instead of putting out water, produced blood. And you say to yourself, God, why would you allow your son to go through all that? And God's only answer is, I love you so much. Dilly dally, God, I'm such a fool. God, I've disappointed you time and again. God, here I am in my 40s and my 50s, and I'm still asking you to forgive me for sins that I committed back there, and I continue to commit up here. What kind of God are you? I'm a loving God. And I've made up my mind how I'm going to save you. And he made him to be sin for us. I was in the um, parking lot today waiting for my ride. And I heard a little girl say, Mommy, look. There's a, and it was a caterpillar. <clears throat> look, mommy, look. I ain't mommy, but I looked. <laughs> there was this caterpillar just crawling along. So the little girls grabbed hold of mommy, so I walked over and get out of here. 
But I got to thinking, God created that bug. And if we left the bug alone and let it grow to maturity, it would go through what we call a metamorphosis. And it would come and be a beautiful monarch butterfly that would fly away. That said to me, you don't have to stay in sin. You don't have to remain a sinner. God is going to put you through a metamorphosis that started in the garden of Gethsemane. That night in the garden, God's son was made sin for me. The incorruptible put on corruption. The immortal one put on mortality. He who knew no sin became sin. Hey, hey, the innocent became guilty. The pure became soiled. What kind of God is this? And the only answer I can come up with is, he loves me. And Satan saw this whole scenario taking place. And he made up his mind, I cannot let this son of God make it to Calvary. I've got to stop him now. Because if I stop him now, I can keep all those believers in Southwest region from being saved. They'll be hooked up to me because he'll be hooked up to me. I don't want to be hooked up to anything God is not hooked up to. And when he says, I died to save you, I took on your sins to save you, I'm running with Jesus. What do you say out there? See, old men see stuff, but then they don't see it. I know that thing is sitting there. I was preaching down in Australia, and the Spirit got hold to me. And the folks started coming down the aisles, accepting Jesus Christ. And instead of them standing down there, those Aussies came up here. And they just started packing that place, and I kept backing up. I knew the edge was right there. But I was so caught up in the spirit, I fell off backwards, five feet. And I fell in slow motion. And I kept saying as I was falling, Lord, why doesn't someone catch me? <laughs> Look here, look here, look here. The metamorphosis, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that night became the lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. That night, that night, we, he became my sinner my sinfulness that I might become his righteousness. What kind of God is this? He's a God of love. And the only reason we're seated here tonight, saints, is because this God loves us so much, he extends his grace to us. And you know what this word grace means? I put it into an acronym. Grace, G-R-A-C-E. God rewards at Christ's expense. And that's what the garden is all about. Listen to me, saints. Satan was present, and with the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with the dread, and here it is, the dread of being separated from his father. And Satan kept pushing him. He kept pressuring him. Do you know if you go through this thing tonight, you're going to be separated your father and you'll never see him again. In other words, Satan was saying, listen, fella, these folk aren't worth it. You have been with your father before eternity, and you're supposed to be with him after eternity. But if you go through this thing tonight and be made sin, you know your father hates sin with a passion. And I know the father hates sin with a passion. But the thing I like about this, God hates, he hates sin the way he hates death. But on top of that, God loves the sinner so much 
that death can't hold us. Saints, Saints, I don't have time to finish, but let me just close with this. If Jesus could go through Gethsemane for us, why can't we stay closer and draw nearer to him? If this thing was real to Jesus that would bring him down from glory and separate him from his father, why can't I avail myself to their power and break away from cigarettes? Why can't I break away with his power from an adulterous relationship? Why can't I break away with his power from lying lips? Why can't I break away and I, I can go on with the list that we in this room are involved in? I was in my car in one city holding a revival. And I was at a traffic light. And I looked and there across the street was a group of pedestrians waiting to cross. And as I just looked, you know how you sit in the car and look? I saw the head deacon of the church. And you know how you just look? No. God points things out to us. I saw him reach in his shirt pocket and put out a pack. I saw him flip it and put it one in his mouth. I saw him dig in here and he came out and flipped his bit. I saw him take that deep drag and lay his head back waiting for the light to change and blow it out. I said, oh my God, what have you shown me? I couldn't make it the rest of the day. I went to my room, I couldn't fall asleep. And finally I said, God, what is it that you want me to do with this information that I have seen? He said, go to it. Matthew chapter 18. Don't get on the phone and call Booker. Don't get on the phone and call Green. If you have ought against a brother, go to the brother. You don't have to call the superintendent of education. You don't have to call your downstairs neighbor. You don't have to call the person you sit beside in church. The Bible says, go to the brother. I got dressed, got in my car, and I drove the way I knew he lived. I got out with a prayer. I rang the doorbell. After a while, his wife came. She said, oh, Pastor Barron, is something wrong? I said, no. Come in. I said, I can't. She says, well, what, what is it that brings you this hour of the night? I need to talk with your husband. He came down. He said, hey, Pastor, come in. I said, no, let's sit in the car. So we got in the car, and he looked at me, and he said, what's going on? I said, you. He said, me? I said, I saw you today on 5th and Main. You were waiting for the light. And I saw you go in your pocket and pull out a cigarette. I saw you put it in your mouth. I saw you light it. Oh my God, my God. I saw you take the first drag. I saw you, my brother, head deacon of the church, blow it out. His, by this time, his head was between his knees. He said, Pastor Barron, I'm wrong. Something I've been struggling with a long time. Where do we go from here? I said, man, we're going to go to prayer. We're going to go to prayer. Grace, based on the love of God, that comes out of the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus made it, 
which says to me, we're going to make it. Yeah. Which says to me, we're making it. Yeah. Despite whatever the devil is showing us and putting on us, by the grace of God, based on the love of God, we are making it. We are saved now. We're going to stay saved until Jesus comes and saves us into eternity. But it's your decision. Is that after 9 o'clock? So what? Let me tell you one last story about the garden. One last story about the garden of Gethsemane. If you look at this thing, Jesus is on the ground sweating blood. And he's crying out to the Father, get rid of this cup. But it's not, and you ask yourself, what in the world was in that cup? What was in that cup? It was God's wrath against sinners. Sinners who were unrepentant. Sinners who didn't believe. Sinners who came to the church and said, I come to Jesus living a lie. It was the wrath of God in that cup against every sinner. And I talked to John the Revelator just this morning, and I said, John, did God show you the contents of that cup? He said, yes, it's the wrath of God to be poured out against every sinner without any mixture of mercy or grace. Raw wrath. You've forgotten that. And then Jesus had to make his, his decision. Do I die for folk like this? And Satan was right there. He said, listen, Jesus, don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. You, you know right now one of your disciples is bartering to betray you. Don't be stupid. And look at that guy stretched out over there. Look at him stretched out over there like all unconcerned. And he's supposed to be your most volatile disciple who, who is in personal ministries and giving Bible studies. And look at him fast asleep. And look at old big mouth Peter. Look at him snoring up a log. And, and, and later on this morning, he's going to deny you along with the rest of these men. And when the mob comes, they're all going to get up and run. And you want to die for this? And then God looks down through the annals of time at us. I let my son die for her? <laughs> I let my son die for this church? Great God, hallelujah. And I close with this. When Jesus made his decision, Father, not my will, but your will be done. A bright light shone from glory. It was so bright, it awakened the disciples. And when Peter and John were awakened by that light, they rubbed their eyes and they adjusted their redness to that brightness. They said, this is the same light we saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the same light that revealed to us God loves his son. And he sent down Elijah and Moses to bring encouragement. Well, who's he bringing tonight? And they looked and something swooshed past them and hit the ground. It was Gabriel. It was the angel Gabriel. Gabriel who replaced Satan in glory. Gabriel who ministered to God himself. When the incarnation took place, it was Gabriel who said, Mary, you're pregnant. Gabriel who will stick with Jesus all the way to Calvary and beyond. Gabriel, an angel of God. And let me tell you something, the spirit of prophecy says, every time a soul comes to Jesus, he assigns a guardian angel to them. No sinner in the street has a guardian angel. No sinner in the bar has a guardian angel. But those of us who love the Lord and are called by his name, we have a guardian angel. And whatever Gabriel did to Jesus that night, he's doing it for us tonight also. Oh, there's so much, so much in that garden. But I've made up my mind. I don't give a hoot what you do. I've preached it. I've taught it. I've shared it in love. Now it's your time. 
you can leave here tonight and drive home and go back home the way you arrived this weekend. That's your business and God's business. But remember this, God loves you so much. He'll do it again. Stand with me. Stand with me so I can pray for us. Father in heaven, we have been blessed to worship you on one of the most beautiful Sabbath experiences. I don't understand you, God. We live like the devil all week and then expect to come into your house and worship you and give you honor and praise through the preached word, the spoken word, the songs, even the prayers. And you know we're not right, God. But you're so God. Your love is so real that you say, don't destroy him now. Hit the reset. And Pastor Green and his staff have said, we're going to follow through with the reset and try to bring this conference constituency to revival. But understand, God, help us to understand that revival without reformation is nothing. We've wasted your time, the preacher's time, and members' time. God, please, please be merciful unto us. As our faces differ, the old folk used to pray, so do our needs for glory. Father, visit with everybody under this roof tonight. And if we don't hearken, don't let us have a good night's rest. Keep us motivated by the Spirit, agitated by the Spirit, frustrated by the Spirit, aggravated by the Spirit, until we do as Jesus did in the garden. I'm going to do your will. I pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And remember two things as we dismiss. God loves you, and so do I.